I do want to join in with Bill today in welcoming those who are visiting with us. We're thankful for your presence. We encourage you, if you will, to take your Bibles and open them to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. It will be the major text for our lesson today. Paul says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul was expressing his feelings about the church. Paul felt this way about the church the world over. But this statement was made to a particular church. This statement was made to a particular congregation. It was made to the church at Corinth. And Paul said to them, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. There should be no question in our minds over how Paul felt about them. There should be no question in our minds that Paul loved them as much as he could possibly love them. His feelings for them were extremely strong. And Paul would fight for them. In the Scriptures, at least three times in the epistles that Paul wrote, Paul would encourage individuals to be followers of him. Be ye followers of me, he would say, in 1 Corinthians 4. Later on in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, he would say, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Paul wanted men to follow him. He wanted men to follow him as he followed Christ. And so today, we would do well to follow Paul. We would do well to feel about the church the way that Paul felt about the church. We would do well to have the kind of love that Paul had for the local church that he had for the church at Corinth, to be like him. Now, we can never love the church more than Jesus loved the church, and I'm not suggesting that Paul loved the church that much. But I believe that Paul got as close to that as a man could get. I think that Paul was determined to the best of his ability to love the church in the way that Jesus loved the church. I hope that that's your determination this morning, to love the church that much, to try to be like Paul in that. We live in a detached age. We live in an age where people seem to be detached from one another. Sometimes people even within the same family are detached from one another. Sometimes husbands and wives don't communicate. Sometimes husbands and wives don't have a great deal to do with one another. Sometimes parents and children are, are detached. We call it dysfunctional. And it is. But you know, there are spiritual families that also can be detached. There are spiritual families that can be dysfunctional. There are spiritual families that cannot foster and build and develop the kind of relationships that they must have in order to be successful in this world. And so it's not just a physical problem. It can be a spiritual problem that we have to focus on and we have to work on and we have to change our attitudes about. Because the easiest person to change, or maybe we should say the hardest person to change, is ourselves. But that's where change has to begin. I want to talk today about the way that Paul felt about the church at Corinth. And I want you, as we do this, to ask yourself, is this the way that I feel about this church? Does Paul's attitude toward them describe my attitude toward the church here at South Haven? Because it ought to, if we're trying to love the church in the way that Paul loved the church, as he sought to love the church as Jesus did. First of all, I want you to consider the fact that for Paul, it was personal. It was personal. Notice in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, that three times in this one little verse, we have that personal pronoun, I. Paul said, I am jealous. I have espoused. I may present. Now that, that strikes me because I know enough about Paul to know that Paul didn't use that word I very much. Paul would include himself with them and he might very well say we or us. 
even in areas where they were wrong and he wasn't. But he would include himself in it. That's the way that Paul generally talked about himself. In 1 Timothy 1, he would describe himself as the chief of sinners. In Ephesians 3 and verse 8, he would describe himself as the least of saints. So Paul was extremely humble. In fact, he was one of the most humble servants that, that God ever had. He said, when it comes to sinners, I'm the worst. When it comes to saints, I'm the least. That's the attitude Paul had. And so Paul didn't use this little word I, this personal pronoun I, very much. When he used it, he had a reason for using it. But three times in this passage, he says, I, I, I. This that's going on in the church at Corinth, what was happening to them was personal with Paul. Paul took it personally. It bothered him on an individual level. It, it wasn't a problem for others. It was a problem for him. He was invested in this congregation. He was concerned with what went on. Now, Paul was humble. But, but don't mistake his humility with his being passive. Paul wasn't passive. He was passionate. He's humble. He didn't say a lot. But he felt a lot. It got Paul in his heart. And sometimes, as in this chapter, Paul says, I've got to say something. I am jealous, Paul says, over you with a godly jealousy. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 11... Paul in writing to another church, because you see, Paul felt this way about every church. He felt this way about Corinth, but he also felt this way about Galatia, and he felt this way about Philippi, he felt this way about Thessalonica, he felt this way about all of them, because, because that's who Paul is. It didn't matter which church it was, if Paul worked with that church, that was Paul's attitude toward them. That's the way he felt. Because he tried to love them as Jesus loved the church. In Galatians 4 and verse 11, Paul says, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul had established the church at Corinth. He had established the church in probably the most improbable place in the ancient world. To have the church in Corinth, really, of all the cities in the ancient world, you couldn't find a city that was more immoral, a city that had more problems, a city more difficult than Corinth, but Paul planted the church there. And Paul was determined that that church that he had planted in Corinth was going to make it. For him, it was personal. He said, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Let me ask you this morning, how personal is it for you what happens to this congregation? How personal is that for you? How personal do you take it when there isn't as much participation as there ought to be? How personal do you take it when the attendance isn't what it's supposed to be? How personal do you take it when we're under budget? How personal is that for you? I'll tell you this, it is as personal as you are invested in it. If you have $10 invested in a mutual fund, and that mutual fund doesn't do well, not a big deal. What about if you've got $10,000 in that mutual fund? Or $100,000 in that mutual fund, and it doesn't do well. It's a bigger deal, right? Because of how much you're invested in it. Let me suggest to you that if it does not bother you, you are not invested enough in this church. You're not invested enough. You've given a token offering instead of everything. You're giving a contribution instead of giving yourself. When somebody falls away, how invested are you in that person? Do you even miss them? Do you do any praying about it? Do you do any calling? Do you do any card sending? Do you do any visiting? Do you do anything? Or do you just go about 
That depends on how invested you are in this church. If you're invested in this church, as Paul was invested in the church at Corinth, you can't sit and do nothing. You have to do something. You have to be involved. It's personal with you because you know these people on a personal level. You're involved in bringing them to Christ. You're involved in developing and building them spiritually. It matters to you. It, 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 it is personal with you because of that. What was happening at, at Corinth was personal for Paul because of how invested he was in them. But you know, we're not just talking about when a brother or sister falls away. We, we might be talking about an occasion when a brother or sister goes away. They say, well, they're going to a faithful church. Well, that's good. Happy for that. They could be going to an unfaithful congregation. That really would be bad, wouldn't it? Don't want that. Maybe we take some consolation in the fact that they're going to a sound church. But how invested have we been in them? If we don't say or do anything, if it doesn't affect us in any way, I want to suggest to you we, we, we haven't been very invested in them. Because if we've been invested in them, then we realize... I'm losing a friend. I'm losing a brother. I'm losing a sister. No, 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 no. They're, they're still going to be faithful, Lord. No, but, but, but I'm not going to see them. If one of my family members has been living in the same town where I'm living and they suddenly tell me they're moving around the world, I'm going to miss them. I, I, I'm not going to see them as much as I used to. I'm not going to have as much a part in their lives. They're not going to have as much a part in my life. I, I, I'm not going to be able to influence them like I once did. They're not going to influence me and encourage me like they once did. Oh, there's a loss because of the investment that's, that's there. The investment that you put in there. Why are you a member of this congregation? Well, some of you would say, well, this is where I was baptized. So I was baptized into this congregation in that sense. Okay? But for most of us, that probably isn't the case. For most of us, we weren't baptized into this congregation. Likely we were baptized somewhere else, but we're now members of this congregation. How did we come to be members of this congregation? By choice, right? Likely when we moved to this community, we said there's a church here, and there's a church here, and there's a church here, and we may have even visited various congregations, and we decided, I'm going to go to South Haven. That's where my family's going to be. That's where we're going to raise our kids. That's where we're going to put our effort. That's where we're going to put our money. That's where we're going to try to exert our influence. We made a choice. When I came to South Haven, I made a choice. Made a choice to come here. I didn't make a choice to go to Forest Hill. Make a choice to go to Nesbitt or Olive Branch. Made a choice to go here. Once I made that choice, then my time, my energy, my effort goes into here. That's where my focus is. Do I want Forest Hill to do well? Absolutely. Olive Branch? Absolutely. Nesbitt? As, as, absolutely. I want them to do well. As they do well, we prosper to some degree from that. I know a few members in each of those congregations. But I don't know the members in those congregations like I know the members here. And I for sure don't have the influence with the members of those congregations that I have the influence here. I may get their bulletin and I may read about people who are sick or things that are going on. But these are the brethren that I enjoy the closest fellowship with. We're fellows in the same ship. We, we share everything in common, everything together. It's personal. It's almost like you're talking about the disciples of Jesus and then you're talking about Peter, James, and John. This is the Peter, James, and John. That's the relationship inside of the relationship. The disciples and their rela that relationship with Jesus, that's one relationship. But Peter, James, and John enjoyed a... a a different relationship. They enjoyed a closer, a more special relationship. 
That's the kind of relationship we're supposed to enjoy. Do we have a relationship with others? Absolutely. But it's not and cannot be as close as this relationship. Because we just don't have the time. We just don't have the energy to put in that big of a circle that we do into this one. There, there is something that's involved in membership. And we might call it personal, we might call it something else, but there's something that we give of ourselves in that. And what happens to this congregation is a reflection on every one of us. Is it a reflection on me? Absolutely, it is. Because some people may make choices based on the preaching. It's not just a reflection on me, it's a reflection on the elders. Some people make choices because of shepherding. But it's not just a reflection upon the elders, it might be a reflection upon the deacons. Because, you see, the deacons are special servants and sometimes people make decisions based on certain areas of service. But it might even be bigger than that. It might even be a reflection on every member of this congregation because it might be a statement that maybe there were those in this congregation that did not get as close, were not as connected, were not as involved as they should have been. The fact of the matter is, when we win, we all win, and when we lose, we all lose. When one's honored, we're all honored. When one suffers, we all suffer. Why? Because that's what it means to be in a family. That's what it means to enjoy this kind of a relationship. Paul felt that for these brethren. Paul felt what these brethren were feeling. Paul was personally connected with them. It's far too easy in our busy world to be impersonal. But what we're trying to have is a Peter, James, John relationship. Not merely to have a relationship, but to have the closest, best relationship that we possibly can have to be vested, invested here. If it doesn't cost you anything, then you haven't put very much into it. But in the second place, for Paul, it was passionate. It was passionate. Notice Paul says, I am jealous over you. Paul says, I am jealous. He talked about a godly jealousy. Two times he used that word jealous. It's a word that sometimes is translated as zealous with a Z instead of a J. In fact, later on, in talking to the Galatians, he's going to talk about them in Galatians 4, 17-19, and he's going to talk about some who are zealously affecting them and he's going to talk about how that is zealously affecting him. That's, that's the same word, same language. Paul says, what's happening to you greatly affects me. It's personal with me. It's passionate with me. My passion is involved in this. I'm not cold. I'm not indifferent. I'm connected. Have you ever thought about what a strong emotion jealousy is? Jealousy is one of the strongest emotions you can ever feel. Jealousy is not passive. Jealousy is active. Jealousy fills your every thought. Jealousy affects every sense in your body. It consumes you. Paul used that word. Think about Song of Solomon 8.6. Song of Solomon is a love song, and so we would expect to find passion in this song. Some think it's a picture of Christ in the church. I tend to think it's a picture of the husband and wife and their relationship. But notice what's said about jealousy in Song of Solomon 8.6. In the verse it says, Love is as strong as death. But then it says, Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are as the coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. He says jealousy is like coals of fire. When you think about coals of fire, you think about that which is red hot, that which is glowing, that which will burn you if you touch it. It's hot. It's not indifferent. 
Paul was not indifferent to the church at Corinth. He was not indifferent to what happened to it. He was jealous over them. And it was a most vehement flame. It wasn't this little candle flame. Lick your fingers and put the flame out. We're not talking about that kind of flame. We're talking about a welding torch. We're talking about a flame that you don't dare approach. A most vehement flame. That's how Paul felt about these brethren. And we're going to see that in the language that he uses regarding them. Consider some of the things he says about them. Consider, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4. If you'll turn back in the book for just a minute. Take a look at, at he's writing to them. He's already written one letter to them, but his passion isn't gone. He hasn't lost his fire. It's still there. He says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Paul says, I wrote these things, not because I wanted you to grieve. Paul says, I wrote these things because I wanted you to know how much I loved you. I wanted you to know how much my heart's pained. I want you to know how many tears I've shed. It was passionate for Paul. It was not passive. His love wasn't lukewarm. It was fervent. It was burning. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 3, Paul would say to them, Ye are in my heart to die and to live. Paul says, You're in my heart. Whether that means life, whether that means death, we've made that kind of a connection. We're in it for the long haul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 15, Paul says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Paul was willing to be spent for them. He was willing to use all that he had. He was willing to give himself for them. Why? Because for Paul, it was not only personal, but it was passionate. It was a matter of the heart for Paul. Paul wasn't a hireling. Jesus talked about the hireling in John chapter 10 in verses 12 and 13. And he says that when the wolf comes, the hireling flees. And he explains, because the hireling careth not for the sheep, the hireling cares about himself. The hireling isn't invested in the sheep. They're not his sheep. It wouldn't be his loss. He's not going to, going to put himself between the wolf and the sheep. He's not going to go any great lengths to save them. He's a hireling. Am I a hireling preacher? Vern, Con, Larry, are you hireling elders? John, Chris, Terry, Joel, Rick, Jim, You hireling deacons? Are you hireling members? I don't like that word. I don't like that word. I don't want to be a hireling. Because Paul wasn't a hireling. Paul would spend and be spent. That's the kind of investment he had. In Philippians 2 and verse 17, he says, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and the service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Paul says, if I be offered the sacrifice and service of your faith, if that's the price, Paul says, I'll, I'll rejoice in that. I'll joy in that. You can't question that Paul was passionate about his relationship with them. How passionate are you about this church? About 
the people that make up this church. How passionate are you about them? First Peter 1 and verse 22, Peter says, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart. Underline it, fervently. Instead of fervently, just put the word jealously. With a pure heart, jealously. When you're jealous, what happens matters. When you're jealous, what's done, what's said matters. It just does. It's passionate. Your heart's in it. You can't be indifferent. In 1 John 3 and verse 16... John says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. So ought we also to lay down our lives for the brethren. Do you realize that the early Christians on many occasions gave their lives for one another? They did more than send a card, make a call, pay a visit. They, they gave their lives for each other. That's how they felt about each other. Is that the way we feel about each other? Can we really say we feel about each other that way if we don't do the things short of death? I don't think any of us are being called upon to die for one another, but if we don't do the things short of that, can we really say that we love like that? Can we really say that we're jealous? Can we really say that this is the passion that we feel? Lamentations 1 and verse 12 Jeremiah, who was the weeping prophet, said to his people, Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? It was something to Jeremiah. It, it was something that cut him to the heart. Is it something that affects you that way? Are you invested like that? Revelation 3, Jesus talked about the church at Laodicea. He said of them that they were lukewarm. They were lukewarm in their love for Him. That must have translated as well into their being lukewarm in their love for one another. Because we love one another to the degree that we love Him. And if our love for Him isn't what it needs to be, our love for one another is going to follow suit. The church is His bride. We have to love her. Think about the final point of this lesson, and that is, for Paul, it was pure. Sometimes when we think about jealousy, we think about a very negative thing, and jealousy can be very negative. In fact, jealousy can move a man to think and say and do things that he ought not to think, say, or do. Jealousy can move a person to take another person's life. The Jews were so moved, weren't they? With our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That passion has to be properly directed, properly channeled. Paul said of his jealousy that it was a godly jealousy. Earlier in the book, he would talk about a godly sincerity. In the middle of the book, he would talk about a godly sorrow. Here he talks about a godly jealousy. The emotions that Paul feels are, are governed by God. They're the emotions that God feels. Paul was striving to be like God. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5 tells us of God. God says, for I am a jealous God. God is a jealous God, and we see that throughout the Old Testament. We see God's great love, God's great zeal for His people. In Exodus 34 and verse 14, we find that God's name is even jealous. That's one of the names given to God. It's so much a part of who God is, about how God feels about His people, that it is His name. He's Jehovah. But he's also jealous. 
God is passionate about His people. He's not passive. He's not indifferent. He's not the God of the deist. He is a God who's very much involved with His people. The book of Exodus says that He heard their cries. And God came to their aid. That's the relationship God has with His people. In Matthew 22 and verse 37, Jesus, in explaining the old law, explained it in terms of two commandments. The first commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Notice all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. God is a jealous God. God won't allow you to divide it with other people. God won't allow you to give a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there and and just to reserve some for Him. No. God says, I want it all. How many of you would have gotten married if your mate had said, I'm going to be mostly dedicated to you? There may occasionally be somebody else, but... Mostly it's going to be you. We would have said, no way. I don't want any part of that. I don't want any part of that. It's all or it's none. God says that in His relationship with us. He says it's all or it's none. You can't be an adulterer or an adulteress with the world. God simply won't tolerate that. God's jealousy for His people, according to Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 12, was a great jealousy. It could not have been greater than it was. No question how God felt about His people. Should it ever be the case that there's a member of this congregation, if we really have a Peter, James, John relationship that doesn't know how we feel about them? We have no difficulty knowing how Paul felt. We have no difficulty knowing how God felt. There should be no difficulty in knowing how we feel. If there is, then maybe we're not expressing it as much as we ought to. In 1 Kings 19 and verse 10, Elijah is going to say to God, and and I, I believe Elijah believed this with all of his heart, he says, I have been very jealous for you. Paul's jealousy was not a personal jealousy. Paul's jealousy was not, I, I'm, I'm jealous for myself. No, Paul was jealous for Christ. He says, I have espoused you to Christ. I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul says, I introduced you to Christ. I led you to Christ. I helped you form this relationship to Christ. And Paul says, I want to see it through. There's a great deal of talk. Some of you no doubt follow sports like I do. and There's a great deal of talk when everything came out about Tiger Woods. There's a great deal of talk about the golfer that introduced Tiger Woods to his wife. And that golfer was talking about how he felt because he brought them together and then this happened. Paul says, I brought you to Christ and now look. It can't be this way. Paul says... I brought you to Christ. As the, as the bride of Christ, you've got to be a pure and a chaste bride of Christ. Paul says we can't have this. Your relationship with Christ has got to be pure and holy. He was jealous, but he was jealous in a very pure way. He was jealous on behalf of another. He was jealous for Christ. How jealous are you for this congregation. How jealous are you for Christ? 
that You do everything within Your power to build and foster the kind of relationships that one day we can all stand in judgment, hand in hand, arm in arm. Our elders can stand there and say, here's the congregation. We built the kind of relationships that withstood. We built the kind of relationships that lasted. We built the kind of relationships that made it safely here. For the preachers to be able to say, here's the congregation. Here's the congregation that we taught week by week to try to get them to this point. Here are the deacons who said, came up after work and I did this and I did that and I worked on this and I worked on that. Here's the congregation that I served. Here they are. Here's brother so-and-so. Here's sister so-and-so. I remember when they were born. I remember seeing them as a young person. I remember when they became a deacon, when they became an elder. I, I, rem- I, I was there for all of that. How jealous are you for the congregation here? Do you feel about this church the way that Paul felt about that church? And let me remind you of one thing in the lesson's yours. That church wasn't a perfect church. The church at Corinth was far from perfect. But it didn't affect the way Paul felt about them. This church is far from perfect. It is. But it should not affect the way we feel about it. Or the love that we have for it. This morning, if you are not a child of God, we invite you to become a child of God. But we want you to understand that this is a marriage to Christ. It is a commitment until death to Christ. It's got to be a personal relationship between you and Him. It's got to involve a great deal of passion. cannot be indifferent. It's got to be a pure relationship. Nothing less than that will do. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Will you repent and turn away from your sins? Will you confess Christ before men that He is the Son of God and be immersed in water for the remission of every sin? That's the plan in Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 16, throughout the New Testament. That's the plan. Will you do that? If you've strayed away, will you come home? If your love for Christ has not been what it needs to be, you've left your first love, Revelation 2 and verse 4, it's time to renew those vows. It's time to make that commitment again. Paul says, I introduced you to Christ. One of these days I want to present you to Christ. Let's get this fixed. This morning, if there's a breach between you and Christ, let's get it fixed. Let's let the elders one day be able to present this congregation all of its members, as ready to meet Him and be with Him forever. If you need to come, come as we stand, as we sing.